Welcome back everybody to Football Discovery. It's Connor Nestor here. As you know, there is nothing we like more than to give you a unique and sometimes alternative insight into the beautiful game. This week's interview is no different. Imagine being a soccer coach in the United States and Bill Belichick gives you a call and asks to borrow one of your players. Or you're a cricket coach in England and Alex Ferguson makes a similar call. This is not something that our interviewee Shane Keegan has to imagine. In his early years as a coach training the Kilkenny Schoolboys League, he gets a call from Brian Cody, the most successful coach in any sport in code in the history of the Republic of Ireland. It was an early indication that he was doing something right. We begin our chat with Shane by reminiscing about a common tutor we both had, the late great Noel O'Reilly, and by asking Shane where he draws his influences from. Yeah, well, I suppose firstly, just to touch on Noel, absolutely. Um, I don't think I'd be singing a different tune than anybody else that you might have spoken on that one. I would have done um, a youth cert um, previous to that under Noel. And at the end of the youth cert weekend, I kind of chanced my arm a little bit um, and approached Noel and just said, look, I'm living up around the Dublin area. If there are any training sessions that you're conducting, is there any chance you could keep me informed of any sessions you've got going on? I'd love to observe you. And uh, Noel being Noel says, oh, sure, we'll make better use of you than that. And it's so all for the next couple of, of weeks and that, I would have went down to a lot of Noel sessions. I would have been doing no more than throwing out cones. He would have been telling me to put this here and that there and running around after balls for him. But um, yeah, what an absolutely brilliant, brilliant learning experience he was. He's, he was just... And that was inspiring approach as you possibly get. Um, but yeah, I suppose, uh, again, um, I suppose I've probably come a slightly different route than a, a lot of, of League of Ireland managers in that I have little to no playing background. Um, so I wouldn't have had managers, let's say, that I would have learned from. Um, it's been very much a case of having to figure it out for myself to a large extent as I go along, um, as well as you know, learning from as many books as possible, as many courses as possible. But um, as I say, I wouldn't have unfortunately had the 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 uh the joy of working under any kind of managers at a really really high level that you could say yeah like what he's doing there or what he's doing there. Um, so it was a, a case as I say of kind of ma- making it up as you go along almost to a certain extent. The trial and error that kind of guided discovery and uh, I suppose you've mentioned that it's come up on a few of our um podcasts so far. Maybe not having that background as a player, but I suppose crucially that means you know from your mid twenties really you're coaching so so now even though you'd be seen as a young manager you're someone that's you know got got well over a decade of experience behind you. Uh, yeah, it would have started well before that to be honest with you. As I say, while it, while it would have been very limited as a player, I would have went from I would have went from captain in the local under sixteen club side to managing the under eight the local under eighteen club side the very following season. So managing guys who were, were, were maybe only less than twelve months younger than you. Um just out of necessity at, at club level, I suppose. But um yeah, I suppose for all my limitations as a player I did maybe show an early attitude for, for getting people to, to do what I wanted them to do and, and, and having a bit of success that way. Um for the next couple of seasons, then I would have managed a, a, a younger team in the club um, and had quite a bit of success with them. That team would have had one very successful player and I suppose I, we, we kind of, our careers kind of followed each other then for a while in that he would step up to county level, I would step up to county level, he'd step up to regional level and all of that, that kind of thing. So you were getting to see some of the best young players in the, in the, in the country playing, but more importantly, you were getting to see... Um, the likes of a, a Darren, Darren Murray in the regional centre going up then bringing him up to FAI assessment days and getting to see the likes of Niall Harrison work different fellas like that um, was it was you know it was uh, very much a case of just keeping your eyes on everything that was going on one thing I would say is I suppose you're, you're trying to pick up as much as possible um, visually when you're looking at things like that whereas the more I kind of progressed the more I, I, I kind of got the feeling that yeah you've, you've got to hear what they're saying um, taking stuff in where you're just seeing what they're doing you're, you're really getting less than 50 percent of the picture you, you know the vast vast majority of coaching is communication you need to you need to know what's going on and that's how you do it as well you know yeah so it, 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 those kind of little details i suppose when you first start coaching you're looking for that magic drill aren't you um and as you get more experienced and you realize that it's it's maybe a little bit more to do with the tiny details and the activity as opposed to that absolutely i mean um you know, again, I would be 
I'd be a firm believer in 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 stealing um stealing ideas and stealing training sessions. But again, it's you know what what's been said or what's been tried to be taught here rather than how big is that grid and how many are playing against how many there. I mean, sometimes you get uh sometimes you can watch a session that can look fantastic, can look fantastic, put on by a coach and no disrespect to you know if this you'll see this in a lot of places where a, a, a session's gone on it looks really good. And, but then as that, set, as that coach is walking off the field at the end of it with a broad smile on his face, if you were to ask him, what were, what were you working on improving in that session? What are they now better at than before the session? I think you'll find the answer might be, well, I don't know, but I saw such and such doing it on YouTube and it looked great. It's not saying yeah. it looked great as well. And, and it did, it probably did look great and they probably did end up learning, but really we should know what we're trying to teach. What is the purpose of, of, of what we're doing rather than just that looks good, I'm going to do that. Yeah, so that, that vision, working from the game back, if you like, and knowing what it is you want to um, impact on and, and design your session from there. Absolutely. Like, if you can, before before you start a practice, it might only be a section of a training session, if it's a 20, 25 minute section of a training session, if you can pull your players in and in 10, 15, maximum 20 seconds say, this is what we're going to do and this is why we're doing it and by the end of it, hopefully we'll be a little bit better at this. It just sets the team. People are more tuned in. They're more tuned in rather than them just walking out and doing something and having no idea of what they're actually looking to work on. You know. And then the psychology of that, Shane. So I'm here looking at a few books in front of me that are obviously um, books that it looks like you've read them anyway, Shane. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I see Pep Confidential here. It's a book that we've actually featured on the website. And Guardiola talks about seducing his players. Um, I'm. I'm hoping he's not being too literal in that sense, but is that essentially what you're talking about in terms of getting the message across to the players why why you're doing what you're doing as well? Well, I I call it buying. Um, mm-hmm. you're, you're trying to get you're trying to get player buying. Um, even if you see, it'll also give you a bit of grace in that. Even if the drill doesn't work out on the pitch as you had intended it to, in your head, if you've explained to the lads at the start of the session what you're looking to do and why you're looking to do it. At least then, if it doesn't quite go according to plan, they can actually see. Okay, yeah, I can see what was was supposed to happen here, yeah. and maybe this is why it didn't happen. And then you might have another go at it in a week's time, where you tweak a few things and you understand why it didn't happen. But getting getting the player buy in, um, for me is is a huge huge part of it. Yeah, and and I suppose it allows room for kind of problem solving then, because the player knows what the problem is he's trying to solve, if you like. Absolutely, and if it does break down, um, and it might break down due to a lack of planning or just not foreseeing something that might happen. I mean, quite often you can read, you can look at a a, a, um, a session plan, and um, you know this happens and then that happens, but then it doesn't actually say well when the ball goes out of play, what's supposed to happen, or you know if there's an odd number, what's supposed to happen, different things like that, and the next thing you turn up with all the best plans and. All of a sudden, you hadn't seen that, um, so sometimes it can it can break down because. But but if if it's breaking down, you don't be afraid to kind of look at the players <laughs> and and ask them, right, this isn't quite happening for us lads. And you be you're in the middle of it. Can you see why this isn't quite working for us? And I don't think there's any shame in them actually sometimes giving you the answer. You know. Yeah, and and I suppose that's creating a culture then as well, isn't it? Where does that? And a sense of empowerment in the group. It's not a, a kind of dictatorial kind of uh, sense. It's more of a round table kind of collaboration. Uh, absolutely. Um, you're trying to make, you're trying to get them right. Somebody's got to be at the top, and somebody's got to be leading, and somebody's got to be laying out. And at the end of the day, somebody has to be the boss, I suppose. But yeah, if 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 the players feel that they've got a certain amount of ownership in terms of what's happening on the training ground, and more importantly, what's happening on match day, um, again. You know, all of a sudden the responsibility is a bit more on on their shoulders, and uh, I say that in a good way. I think that's a good thing for them when they when they feel that. I find you get that bit more out of them when they feel that they are actually a big part of what's happening rather than being told what's happening. Yeah, and of course, if they're being told what's happening, the issue you're always going to have is what what happens when something happens that they haven't been told about. Um, I've told this story so many times that I'm probably I'm pretty sure you might have been in a room at some stage when I might have told it but um, I already mentioned Niall Harrison um, so I, I, I would have had a very very good Kilkenny representative squad um, that went to an All-Ireland final they would have beaten um, 
the DDSL 6-1 in a semi-final and I remember thinking oh we've got the best group ever and I'm the best coach in the world and all of this kind of crack and um, the end of that season anyway the, the, the international trials were on and uh, I was thinking we were surefire to have four or five possibly named in, in the Irish squad um, and we, we, we ended up with only one um, but because I had a decent relationship with Niall, I, I, I knew that I'd be able to pick up the phone and just have a quick chat with Niall on, on, on why the boys hadn't maybe performed at the trials. Um, and yeah, Niall, Niall gave me one of the most awakening uh, moments I've ever had where he told me that um, having watched my teams, um, I seem to have players who would jump off a roof at a moment at a moment's notice if I told them to jump off a roof and would, or would die for me and would do this and would do that. But uh, when I wasn't there to tell them what I wanted them to do, they had no free thought of their own and they weren't able to problem solve themselves. And essentially, at the trials, they all did quite poorly because they were so used to being told every minute detail of what to do throughout the game by me feeding info in from the sideline that in a trial scenario, it just wasn't happening. And basically, it changed my whole kind of concept in terms of the work I should be doing with players and how I should be going about it, you know? Yeah, and it's interesting you say that because it's... It, 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 it shows the evolution of, I suppose, your last answer in terms of that empowerment approach and that that collective and that knowing the reason why you're doing things. And without that failure, if you like, you, you never would have got to there. Uh, and that's where, I suppose, the experience of not being a player and, and put, throwing, throwing you into the deep end uh, as a young coach lends itself to, to learning that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, very, very much so. And it was just... You know, it was a, a lightning bolt moment where it was a complete and utter change of mindset. I, I did go from the perfect example of a results are everything coach to a, oh my God, I've been looking at this completely wrong player development and the results should mean next to nothing. Literally over over the course of one conversation with Niall, the, the mindset went from one, one end of that to the other. Um, and I pretty much stuck with that new mindset. Um. I've got a I've got a, a brother who's who's thirteen, fourteen years of age and um who's coming up along the ranks and he's doing quite well and he went off and played up in the DDSL and all of that kind of thing and I'm standing sidelines at his games and that kind of thing and I can honestly say I don't care what the scoreline is in, in any of his games and thankfully he doesn't seem to be overly bothered on it either. Um it's kind of, you know, the conversation in the day or two after one of his games is kind of always about, well, what did you think he did well? What did you think he didn't do well? What can you learn from it? All of that kind of thing that, uh, you know, prior to prior to that conversation with Niall Harrison, it would have been roaring in from the sideline and telling him to do this better and do that better. So uh, thankfully the, the mindset has changed there, you know? Yeah, well, Niall has come up in conversation a few times on these podcasts. <laughs> I bet he has. He has um, a way of uh, getting his point across and, and changing people's mindsets. Um, which is, I think, being a big benefit to Irish football. Um, talk to me about your career so far. For me, there's a common denominator, if you think, uh, Kilkenny School Boys, um, Carlo FC in the championship, uh, you know, was kind of newly formed at that time. No, no kind of history in the game, if you, if you want to put it that way. Um, and then going to, you know, a Wexford team who... You know, were pretty much the whipping boys in the first division for 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 a few years. With with all respect to to everyone that was involved, that was just how things were going. So for me, like the common denominator between those three three roles is, like, how do you light the fire in those? How do you get those horrors want to be soccer players in Kilkenny? How do you start from scratch at Carlo, and how do you turn things around as pretty pretty rapidly? Um, I know maybe season three, season four, before you know your promotions and stuff like that, or but even in season one, there was a rapid change in Wexford for anyone that was watching the games. Yeah, again, I'm going to, I suppose, going to go back to the phrase of, of, of buy in. Um, and buy in means different things to different people, it certainly means different things to different age groups in comparison to working with kids uh, as opposed to working with adults. But, yeah, you went into Kilkenny and you, you are kind of very quickly hearing about the fact that you're you're always going to be playing second fiddle to Harlan and you know, when you're clash with Harlan you're gonna you're gonna lose all your best players and that kind of thing. So I suppose from day one it was right, well, 
let's not just take that as a given and let's see how can we go about changing that. And I suppose we went about changing it in, in, in two ways, really. Um, I suppose in, in most cases, the prime example would be the, the most talented player we would have had in that squad at the time would have been Mikey Drennan. Um, now, at the time, Mikey was one of those guys who was, he was, he was I think it's fair to say, he was pretty much the best hurler in the country, never mind Kilkenny Kenny um, at the time. I think he might have been the best handballer in the country at the same time. He was just one of those fellas, you know, a natural athlete who was, who was good at everything. Um, and with guys like Mikey and a few more, because I, I think we were looking at about 50% of, of the Kilkenny under 13 soccer squad that year would have been the Kilkenny, you know, under 13 hurling development squad. Um, it was a case of, right, we need to make these lads enjoy their football, enjoy their training to a level that they've never enjoyed it before, so that all of a sudden it's not just well there's hurling and going hurling, all of a sudden might be put on really enjoying my soccer. Oh, I want to go to soccer. Um, but then on top of that, could we build communication? Could we build relationships with some of the power brokers over in the hurling? Um, and that was a big part of it. Talking to the guys who were over the development squads, talking to the guys who were over the club side, saying. You're training this night, right? We'll go that night, you know. Rather than saying, "Well, we're training that night," and if you clash, so be it. But like that makes no sense to me. Let's let's talk to the people who the clashes might occur with. Um, and I mean, at the the best uh, where it, where it really really came to fruition was sitting at home on 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 a Saturday morning um, and getting getting a phone call from Brian Cody, Mikey Drennan was it, and um, James Stevens, which is is Brian's club site. Um, Basically, we had told the, the boys uh, leading up to the Kennedy Cup that, you know, hurl away. Whenever you're hurling, you know, we'll try and manoeuvre around your hurling. But Sunday morning, we, we would train on a Sunday morning in Castle Palmer. We'd really, really like you to make sure that you're, you're making every Sunday. We can, we can handle you missing some of the midweek ones, but can you be there every Sunday? Um, and on a Saturday morning, I got a phone call from, from Brian Cody saying, um, look, I understand your situation with Mikey Drennan. You've been doing brilliant work with them the whole lot. Um, everything seems to be going great for you. Well done, the time and effort you're putting in. Look, I understand you have a rule about Sunday mornings, Shane, he says, but we have one game coming up next Sunday. He says it's probably the only Sunday morning game we've got all year long. He says that Mikey's a huge part of it. It's a big game for us. Mikey's a huge part of it. Is there any chance you could you could uh, give him an, a, you know, a, buy, a buy on that one? And of course, no, no problem, absolutely. But to get a fella... Um, who's such a top dog in his sport as, as Brian Cody phoning you up um, and, and looking for you to do a favour back because you've kind of worked with them and danced around them for a lot of years shows uh, what can be achieved with a bit of communication, you know? Yeah, and it's, it's obviously clearly built up respect as well. Yeah. Know, from, and uh, respect from, from the player in that, that circumstance as well in that he didn't want to, to miss that Sunday, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and look, you know, Mike has obviously gone to the club and, and said to him, you know, you know, we're, we're supposed to be in Castle Gomer every Sunday, you know, and that's where I need to be. And I suppose they were clever enough in, 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 in uh, they were clever enough in James Stevens to think rather than any Joe Soap making a phone call here to see if we can get Mike off training, we'll get the, we'll get the main man to make it. It might uh, carry a bit more weight if he's making the call, you know. Very good. And then we say, so you, you advanced in into to Carlo in what was the old A Championship, which I suppose we do have some listeners from outside Ireland, so yeah. It was kind of the third tier of Irish football or a reserve league or a league for areas where there was no senior football, if you like. Yeah, um, I suppose I'd start to get a bit, I'd, I'd really start to get into it. It was probably in and around that stage that, that myself and yourself were doing the B licence and that. And um, I don't know, it was just something in me that said, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd really like to get a, a, a crack at adult football here and test myself at, at that level. And... Um, yeah, to be honest, I'm, I'd be a, a, a strong believer in that um, you have to make things happen. You have to make things happen. And, and I think I have no problem in, in seven, eight, nine doors shutting in my face as long as the tenth one opens. And um, I would have pursued a few different avenues in how I might have tried to get into to adult football um, at a decent level. And just one of those avenues, as I say, a lot of them went absolutely nowhere. But one of those avenues was doing a bit of research on the internet, came across the A Championship, didn't even know much about myself, for all my interest in soccer, I didn't know much about the A Championship at the mm-hmm. time, came across the A Championship, saw amazingly that there was an A Championship club on my, well, on my doorstep, as in only about a half an hour away from me, um, got the club details, rang the chairman, um, told him who I was, um, said I'd love to, to come down and get involved in, in some capacity, um, and then that's where the element of luck came in, he, he said to me that, uh, he got a phone call about a week previous from the coach who had been in charge saying that he, he was looking to step away from it. Um, 
and he said, look, you might come in and just take a couple of sessions while we're looking to, to, to fill the gap. And we made it fairly clear that, that at 27 years of age, he saw me as being too young to be the, the manager, but I might come in as a coach and, and take a few sessions in pre-season while they were looking to appoint a, a manager. And um, I came in, I just prepared as much as possible, um, took a few sessions, feedback from the players towards the chairman seemed to be quite good. And before I knew it, I was, I was the, the manager. Um, and yeah, again, now it was about getting player buy-in, you know, could you could you put on really, really good training sessions? Could you deal with people? Could you have a lot of respect towards them when you're communicating with them? Um, again, could you know, could you get that buy-in from them? Um, that might make them perform to a higher level or give you more than they would normally give of themselves. Um, and it worked quite well. We had we had a couple of really, really good seasons there. So we had working with with almost exclusively young junior players. Um and we had we had uh two two and a half seasons of, of what would certainly have been success I suppose based on, on how they would have been doing previously. And that then led to an opportunity in Wexford. Um I suppose you, you tapped into things in the area and that, that that's something that's crept up already in a few of your answers. So maybe explain to some of the people that are listening how how you maybe change things um, in terms of mindset, but also in terms of actually um, going, okay, what's unique to this area, you know? Yeah, well, I think I think Wexford was definitely one where it was, you know, trying not to be too jargony here, but that was definitely one where the, the, the culture change was absolutely everything. Um, I mean, let's be honest, for a manager, it's not exactly um, a bad situation to be walking in to a dressing room where all they've known for the previous the season, season is defeat because you're you know you really there is only one direction things can go in if you have anything about you at all at all you know um so yeah i mean i say trying to avoid jargon this sounds ridiculously americanized so it does but the, i mean the very first thing that we would have done when i landed down there was was we got the the uh the the name plates on the front of the home and the away dressing room swapped over that that the away one now we came the home on and vice versa partly practicality the, the the what was the away one actually looked to be a better dressing room to me to be honest um but more so it was a case of right you've spent the last season walking out of this dressing room and getting bet pretty much every time you came out of it let's let's get away from that dressing room let's get away from that um that environment and try and and, and create a different kind of approach from day one look we held a, a meeting that probably would have went on two, three hours, I think the lads were, were absolutely sick to death of listening to me by the end of it, where we tried to set out what we were going to do, how we were going to go about it, what I expected of them, how could they, what they should be expecting of me, all these different kinds of things. Recruitment, we did it quite cleverly in that there, there was little to no budget um, for paying fellas. So it was a case of, right, let's look at Wexford. Let's look at, I'll be honest, in terms of looking at Wexford itself, at the time there probably wasn't a fantastic relationship between Wexford youths and the local junior clubs, which is quite often the case, to be honest. Um, at any League of Ireland club, it can sometimes be tetchy um, in terms of player movement and all that kind of thing. So Wexford actually turned out to be probably the hardest area to recruit from. Um, I would have pulled an awful lot of players from the Kilkenny District League, um, because that's where my own background would have been. But again... If I had been taken over to Kenny City, I probably wouldn't have managed to get any of those players again because of local politics. So when um when freebooters ever being wherever I was taking guys from, you know, they're not as um touchy about players moving from there down to Wexford as they would have been from there to Kenny City. So we would have got quite a few in from Kenny, um, Waterford, uh, Wexford, Carlo, Wicklow. You know, we really had to look around and see of that. An, un- an unbelievable amount of junior games during that time, um, Oscar trainer games, underage games, all that kind of thing. Um, and a huge, huge part of it as well was trying, and it, it still is, particularly at the moment where I've just moved into the, a new club for the first time in five years, trying to do as much of a background check on their personalities as on their playing ability, probably even more so on their personalities than on their, their playing ability. Um, and because of that, and because of such a focus and an emphasis on, on trying to get the right characters into a dressing room, you end up with guys like Graham Doyle and, and, and Aidan Roxkeen, who are fellas that you can kind of hang your hat on when you are looking to change a, a culture and change a mindset and create a whole new kind of professionalism. It's probably the wrong word, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, I mean, those two people, probably in particular, to be fair to them, probably drove it as much if not more so than I did. Um, they were guys who could rule the dressing room for me, could solve problems within that dressing room before I ever even had to hear about them. 
Um, and that's brilliant. When you've got that going on, you know, in this case of, right, lads, going to give you a serious amount of authority, providing you don't take the piss here. Um, look, obviously, if there's anything kind of that she feels above your pay grade, you come and hit me with it. But uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you take a, a fair amount of responsibility here. And again, that, that you know, that um, approach of empowerment means that, that they just get massive, massive buy-in from fellas under here and that. And uh, yeah, the first season was very, very good. I think we managed to finish finish fourth in the first season. Um, second season, while we finished fifth, we actually had a higher points tally, so we were able to see it as progression. Um, fourth again in, in the third season, and then went on and managed to, to win the thing um, in the fourth season in charge, which was was really, really fantastic achievement in that the lads were still being talked about as, you know, much more <laughs> in line for relegation than winning any league title and that. But we'd, we'd managed to build on it and build on it, both in terms of the culture and the mindset and all that, but also in terms of the quality that we'd managed to start to get into the place. And it was uh, it was it was an incredibly enjoy- enjoyable feat. And I suppose you, you mentioned about using kind of senior players as kind of driving the peer groups. Um, but year four success, because you had a very young squad, right? And it was that that little by little improvement year after year in them as individuals as well as that maturity how do you in a very short term uh, role uh, as a football manager how do you go about taking that kind of long term approach yeah look I suppose I was quite lucky in that you know again you were going into a club that for a couple of different reasons and um, was the absolute ideal place to be walking into as as for two for two reasons it was my first outright proper League of Ireland job, um so that obviously is a big test and two again I'm still quite young I mean I was twenty nine taking over so there are two things that could cause you a big big problem, um but because Mick Wallace as chairman I suppose was is a guy who looks at the bigger picture and isn't very he isn't the results based man there's there's no doubt about it i mean his whole ethos of the club and how the club should work um is very very different and very very unique so it is um so you know i remember one particular night where we were after losing i think maybe three four games on the bounce um and mick approached me upstairs in in the, the bar where supporters were and all that kind of crack and that's could he have a word with me in the back and i'm thinking oh lovely here here we go <laughs> and um we went in the back and and mick genuinely looked at me and says uh What's wrong with Chase? Is it a fierce long face in there? You look like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. And I says, of course, <laughs> of course I look like that, mate. We're, we've now lost four in the balance, you know. Everything's, things are not good, like things are not going well for me at the minute. And Mix looked at me, you know, as if I had two heads and says, Jesus, Shane, you're actually sunny game of soccer. Like, you know, you're, you're taking all this a little bit too seriously, which is about as unique a take as you'll get from chairman anywhere, I think, to be quite fair to him. Um, now, that said, you know, we finished fourth in our first season. The second season was the only one that you could say didn't show maybe you know huge signs of improvement. Again, the third season we were just we just missed out on that final playoff position. So there was progression. There was constant progression, and you could see that we were moving the thing in the right direction. So it wasn't that he was having massive amount of patience with an Egypt who was going nowhere yeah. fast kind of a thing. Um, but at the same time, it it allows you to flourish, it allows you to, to, as you say, take a little bit more long term, deal with younger players and all that kind of thing if you don't have um, a board or, or that kind of thing breathing down your neck, particularly when it's your first job and you're so young and you're, you're learning, I mean, the amount of mistakes um, that I was making in those three, four years um, were phenomenal, but, you know, again, as I say, it just it really, really was a perfect environment to be allowed to make those mistakes. How, how do you change um approach now or do you change approach moving from a, a place where you maybe had to instill expectation or in, in instill a, a a pride and a will to win uh, to going into you know Galway United now who obviously have a great tradition and history in the League of Ireland uh but I think it's it's probably fair to say you, you're not in the top 5 budget wise um I probably could have extended that a little <laughs> bit, um, but at the same time, you know, you 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 have a fan base and a, an ambitious club, um, ambitious players. Does that tilt things on on its head a little bit for you? Is it kind of 
different mentality for you going through the door in the morning now? Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Look, if 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 you want to progress um in life, you're 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 going to find that there's there's pros and cons for everything. So there is um there's some fantastic uh it's a fantastic opportunity at Galway in that. You look at the stadium. Um, you look at at the train facilities that we've got. Um, you look at at the support in the club, the history, all of that kind of thing. I suppose Galway supporters are looking and they're going, you know, things are in place here for this club to really, really kick on, and they're right. And I suppose they're they're looking at at the 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 financial backing from the Comers and all of that kind of thing, and they're saying, you know, everything is in place here, and it is. It it is. There's no doubt it is. The only thing is, I suppose, is. That also applies to, to quite a few other clubs. Um, I mean, you're looking at it this year, and I'd say um, you're looking at it, almost everybody in the Premier Division feels that they should be able to finish in and around mid table um, or above. Um, and obviously, you've you've got four, five, six teams who feel that they're capable of winning the league. So it's going to make for a really, really interesting season. In terms of of my own expectations, look. A manager, a manager is brought in to try and overachieve. It's as simple as that. You know, you're, you're, you you look at, I suppose, where your budget technically should have you finishing and then you're aiming to finish two, three places above where your budget should technically have you finishing. And that's that's my aim. That's the player's aim. That's what the, the board wants. That's what everybody, that's what supporters want. They want uh, value for money and, and that's what we've got to try and deliver. The players, um, again, I suppose I've been been massively 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 impressed by the, the sort of personality and the, the, the attitude and mindset that have encountered there so far um they're working so so hard i mean just to give you an idea yesterday you're talking about about a triple session the boys were in for half past eight they trained from nine o'clock to quarter to eleven um we went and we got a bite to eat we were back out then for a slightly lighter session from half twelve to one o'clock and they were in the gym then from two until three um now fair enough they got today off then to go and recover from all of that but, I mean, there wasn't a moan, there wasn't a whinge, there wasn't anybody looking to duck or dive or, or, or take any corners in that yesterday, so there wasn't. And that's been the case since day one. So, you know, the, the personalities that were there from last year, plus the ones that we've, the new faces that we've we've added, there, there seems to be a really, really good vibe around the place. And it's 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 going to be really interesting, very interesting for me. I mean, you know, if we can, first time in a new dressing room for five years. Um, it's, it's, it's really, really exciting for myself, you know. And... I suppose with that excitement, talk to us a little bit about your vision for 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 running a club. I I know you spoke about the budget in 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 Wexford, which in, in fairness, you know, was non-existent really in many respects. But like you, you box clever a lot in Wexford in terms of those hidden variables or, or or doing that little bit extra maybe with your sports science, with your your um your analysis. Um, how is that going to lend itself to to this role now with Galway? Yeah, it's still very similar. Look, don't get me wrong. You know, it's 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 there is a huge difference in in um the finances behind both clubs. But yet, as you've said, we would be we still very much. I mean, we would still be very much on the lower end of things in terms of finances within the Premier Division itself. So when you sit down with a player, um, the sales pitch is still pretty much the exact same as it was at Wexford Utes because inevitably that player is talking to another club who is able to offer him more money. So if the sales pitch is just about money, you're going to lose. He's going to go to that other club. You've got to find a way of, of, of selling the club to him um, in other ways. So, yeah, I, I think the modern player kind of really, really likes the whole sports science side of things. Look, sports science can never, ever win you a game. That I, I completely understand that. But it, it does have a role to play. There's no doubt it has a role to play. And when you're sitting down with players and saying, you know, we're big users of, of, of GPS and here's the kind of information we'll be able to give you back off the GPS and this is how I think it can help you improve as a player. We're huge users of video analysis and statistics. Here's the kind of information that you'll get back from your analysis, from your statistics. Can you see how this would help you improve? How this would help you see where your weak points are? This will help me devise drills to then go and address those weak points with you, all of that kind of thing. You can see them kind of nodding and smiling and liking the sound of it and that kind of thing. Um, and I, I suppose that, that, you know, that played a big part in it. And then you're also saying to them that, look, you know, I, I don't believe in a, a student-teacher relationship. Um, I, I'd like to think that I'm going to have a different approach as a manager than maybe some managers that you've had in the past. You'll get a lot of say here, you know, you'll be treated in a particular way here. Um, and 
by by firing that kind of sales pitch, I suppose that at, at quite a lot of players we've managed to to recruit quite a few decent ones, and, and certainly managed to recruit in, in three or four scenarios fellows who were, were certainly been offered um, I suppose a better financial package elsewhere. Don't get me wrong, there, you know there's a few that I chatted with who unfortunately have ended up at, at at other clubs, but that that will happen. Um, but yeah, look, I mean I would like to think that that whole kind of um video analysis, GPS, all that kind of thing might have helped us kind of punch above our weight um, at Wexford Utes, so it is, and, and that's that's essentially, again, that's the aim, can you find ways and means, can you find anything, be it communication, be it sports science, be it coaching methods, what can you find that will help you as a club punch above your weight? I'll leave you with one more question because I know that you're a very busy man, you, <laughs> you rush to get here and you'll be rushing to get out of here too. Um, that's what can Galway United fans expect in terms of playing style for the year? Um, uh, will that vary massively from game to game? And also, I suppose, performance wise, you spoke about there's going to be days when you come up against teams that just have more resources. What will the kind of key performance indicators for you be uh, in those games? What are the things you're going to go to other than the scoreline? Which obviously is the one. Yeah. That 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 that's the most important. Absolutely not. Look, um, I know it's again, it's, it it is very cliche to say it, but but work rate. Um, you can lose and you can handle losing if the work rate is there. Um, and again, I am very very conscious not to 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 almost to make me self sound like a football nerd when I throw out the different bits and pieces. But you know, for um. For me to say work rate, I'm not talking about my perception of whether you ran around enough. I'm talking about the numbers that came back from the GPS vests. Simple, the, the hard numbers. This is the amount of ground that we covered last week when we bet Bray 2-0. And this is the amount of ground that we covered this week when we lost 2-0 to Finharps. Can you see that we covered 5 kilometers less as a team? That there in one nugget is a large reason as to why you you you've not won today's game. I'm not saying that running around on the football pitch is is everything, um, but I'll tell you it's it's a pretty good indicator. Um, and from from my experience, it tends to tie in quite well with results. Um, by and large, so it does. Style of play. Look, I think we did get a lot of plaudits in terms of the way we tried to go about it. Um, when I was at Wexford, I would be a huge huge believer in 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 trying to get it down and 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 trying to play as much as possible. That said, you have a look at what the um, tools you have at your disposal are. Um, again, at Wexford Youths, we had a guy in, in, in Rox Keenan who was probably certainly in the first division when we were in the first division, was the best player in the first division in the air, bar none. Um, so we, we had to utilise that quite a bit. It would make absolutely no sense whatsoever if, if he wasn't, wasn't getting um, crosses or wasn't getting balls to, to flick on to put Danny Furlong through or things like that. Um, so look, you know, there's some really really talented players within this squad the likes of Vinny Faherty will want to be on the end of crosses so yeah we need to get into the final third and put crosses in the likes of David Colley and Gavin Ullin will want to receive ball off their back four um, Stephen Fole and Colin Horgan are guys who are hugely technical will want to have the ability to feed it into into centre midfielders with accuracy and with pace all day so we've got quite a mix of um, talent in, in I mean you look at a guy like Kevin Devaney who's arguably one of the best 1v1 players um, in the league you know you want to try and create as many 1v1 scenarios for him as possible but we will we'll mix it up you'll find that there will be a different approach I mean you just look at our first two games you couldn't have a better contrast you know at home to draw that we've got you know already we've got a very kind of an idea building in terms of how we need to play um, against draw how we need to go about it what the game plan will be second game is away to Cork City um, you know the the tools required and the game plan required um, to try and get a result from that one as against what we need to do to try and get a result from the Drogheda one you know it's it's chop and cheese um, so it, it will chop and change quite a lot but I suppose after all that first and foremost I'd ask them for a bit of patience with us um, you know it, it's there is I have no magic wand that keeps saying that there is going to be no overnight success um, I'd love to think that I get five years at Galway as I did at Wexford and I'd love to think that there will be con consistent gradual signs of improvement that if there's consistent gradual signs of improvement by the end of year five all of a sudden you're doing something really really special or the end of year four which was the case with Wexford Utes I suppose you're doing something really really special even though there was no 
light bulb moment or no you know no overnight success and um, consistent gradual improvement can lead to, to, to massive things happening over a couple of years you know Shane um, we'll, we'll wrap it up I'm very conscious of your time I know you're rushing to uh, David Ford who's, who's getting a special uh, commemoration in uh, in I think City Hall today That's is it right, yeah. um, so um, I suppose all I can say is um, on a day when uh, somebody has been I suppose getting accolades for his safe hands uh, that on behalf of us here on Football Discovery having had the pleasure of seeing you at work on a number of occasions we definitely feel that Galway United are in very safe hands the best of luck to you for the rest of the season and of course we'll be bugging you at different points <laughs> and uh, talking to you about um, what you spoke about in your vision today and hopefully in your realisation of it throughout the season Cheers, Connor. Thank you. So that's it for another week here at Football Discovery. A big thank you goes out to Shane Keegan, a positive and infectious football manager with a holistic approach. What do we say to the Galway fans that were listening in? Well, as a famous Catalan once put it, fasten your seatbelts. We believe... It's going to be an interesting season ahead for you guys. And here at Football Discovery, we wish you the best. Until next time, thanks for stopping by. <laughs>